Hi, this is John Whitaker for the Mathematical Analysis 2 class, and this is uh, Lecture 15, uh, where we had left off in Lecture 14 with a statement having to do with the summation of uh, uh, unit step functions as the uh, function that we were using to integrate with respect to, and I'd like to go back to that statement as uh, well as complete the proof. We've done a little work towards it, but here's the statement. <coughs> It says, suppose Cn is greater than or equal to zero for one, two, three, forever. And the summation of the Cn as uh, n runs from one to infinity converges uh, we assume that Sn is a sequence of distinct points in the open interval from A to B, and we define the alpha of X to be equal to the sum as N runs from 1 to infinity of C sub N times I of x minus s sub n, <clears throat> we let f be continuous on a to b <clears throat> then the Riemann still just of f with respect to alpha is equal to the sum as n runs from 1 to infinity of c sub n times f of s sub n. This is analogous to, or more complicated, to a statement that we had in lecture 14. Of course, we had this statement in lecture 14 as well, but we did a, a theorem before this statement that just had <coughs> one s involved. So here, uh, as proof, what we say is for each fixed x element of a to b, um, this series, as n runs from 1 to infinity, of c sub n, the step function acting on x minus s sub n, okay, is a Convergent series. Okay, so we're fixing an x to say uh, <coughs> that that's a convergent series. And it's, it seems so the reason it's a convergent series can be thought of this way is that, <coughs> look, uh, depending upon what, uh, uh, what x is here, uh, <coughs> a lot of these step function parts could be equal to zero. And so this sum for a fixed x is definitely going to be less than or equal to this sum of the c sub n's. And they're all positive, and since this sum of the c sub n's converges, it's going to force this guy to converge. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We'd like for the alpha to be uh, increasing, so let x sub 1 be less than x sub 2. Then, uh, for each n, what we have is 0 is less than or equal to the step function. <coughs> uh, x sub 1 minus s sub n, which will be less than or equal to the step function acting on x sub 2 minus s sub n. Since, C sub n's are always greater than or equal to zero. Then we have C sub n for this particular n, or fixed n, times the i of x sub 1 minus s sub n is going to be less than or equal to C sub n acting on this um, evaluation of i. So x sub 2 minus s sub n, i evaluated at that. <coughs> <coughs> Thus, 
less, of course this is the definition of alpha of x sub 1 is equals to, well, <coughs> the definition involves the sum. The sum is n runs for 1 to infinity of c sub n i x sub 1 minus s sub n is going to be less than or equal to the sum as n runs from 1 to infinity of c sub n times i of x sub 2 minus s sub n. And that's equal to alpha of x sub 2. Okay, so that tells us that alpha of x is monotonically increasing. Wonderful. Okay, next thing to note is that alpha of a, uh, that's going to be equal to uh, zero because the s of n's are always uh, in between a and b, open in. And so I acting on A minus S of N, that's going to be zero. It's zero times something zero and something zero is zero. So that's zero. And alpha of B. Now in this case, the B is going to be greater than all the S of N. And so the I of B minus S of N, that guy is always going to be equal to one. So this is equal to the sum as n runs from 1 to infinity of the c sub n's. Well, we start off by letting epsilon be greater than zero uh, be given <clears throat> in terms of the real contents of the proof. We start with this. And um, <coughs> <coughs> since the c sub n's are always greater than or equal to zero, then if you look at the partial sums, let's call them. Uh, T sub n, so this is the partial sums. T sub n's as n runs from 1 to infinity of, uh, that's going to be equal to the partial sums as k maybe runs from <coughs> 1 to n of C sub k is an increasing uh, sequence. And we know that it converges. Converge to the soup of the T sub n's. <coughs> this is about a monotone convergence theorem, and which we could just call uh, T, which equals to the sum as n runs, or k runs, from 1 to infinity of T sub k. So, what that means is that there exists a natural number n such that for all n greater than or equal to this big N, this t minus the sum as uh, k runs from 1 to this n of c sub k, that's going to be less than epsilon. That's what it means for this sequence of partial sums to converge to T. <clears throat> and so what that tells us is that in particular we have that uh, this T represented by uh, K running from 1 to infinity 
of C sub K minus, and here, let us let N be equal to the big N. So this sum is K runs from 1 to big N of C sub K. That's going to be less than that sum. And so this can be symbolized, this left hand side, can be symbolized as, run, uh, as the k's running from n plus 1 up to infinity of c sub k. Uh, <clears throat> that's going to be less than epsilon. That's what this left hand side is. C1 times uh, B1 plus C2 times B2 plus <clears throat> all the way up to C sub big N times B sub big N, where <clears throat> what I'm denoting by the, the B sub, let's call them I's, is either equal to 1 or 0. Okay? Okay? And, you know, that the B sub I's are really equal to uh, I of X minus S sub I. Okay. And we know that the interval from A to B of F D alpha sub 1 would be equal to the sum as J runs from uh, 1, so I'm changing the I's here, J runs from 1 to N <coughs> of the intervals of A to B of F of D sub C J, and then I'm writing down this as B J. I've changed this into J. Let me change it to I. I is too late. <coughs> that had to do with the extension of something we had earlier uh, in terms of the Riemann Stiltz integral, where when we had what we were integrating with respect to that function was the sum of other functions. <coughs> okay. And then, of course, we can take that constant out of at least this part. So it's the sum as i runs from 1 to n of c sub i, integral from a to b of f d b i. And then we get to use the previous fact that we had that says this is the sum as i runs from 1 to big N of c sub i f of s sub n. So each one of these by the previous thing the one we're proving right now was this sum. <coughs> and one thing I want to note is we know, or 
we do, uh, this integral from a to b of f d alpha sub 1 exists because uh, f is continuous. <coughs> is continuous on A to B. And so we have a fact that says, look, it's continuous, and you've got one of these monotone increasing uh, functions that you're integrating with respect to, then that Riemann Stiller's integral exists. Okay. Well, Of two of a equals to zero, and the alpha of two of b. Well, it's going to be the sum um, as n little n runs from n plus one up to infinity of c sub n, and we know that that's less than uh, epsilon. So a sub two of b minus a sub 2 of a is going to be less than epsilon. Since f is continuous, uh, <clears throat> then the integral from a to b of f the alpha sub 2 exists. And the absolute value for me to be of f of d alpha sub 2, the absolute value of that integral, is going to be less than or equal to uh, m times alpha sub 2 of b minus alpha sub 2 of a, something we proved before, where m is equal to the soup of the f of a. Inside absolute values. Now, <clears throat> since alpha is really equal to alpha sub one plus alpha sub two, we have that the integral from a to b of f d alpha is really equal to the integral from a to b of f d alpha sub one plus the integral from a to b of f d alpha sub two. So, we have the integral from a to b of f d alpha <clears throat> minus the integral from a to b of f d alpha sub 1. That's going to be equal to the integral from a to b of f d alpha sub 2. So, we look at the absolute value of this difference. So, the integral from a to b of f d alpha minus the integral from a to b of f d alpha sub 1. <clears throat> That's going to be equal to the absolute value from a to b of f d alpha sub 2, which we know to be less than or equal to m times this alpha of b alpha sub 2 b. Uh, minus alpha sub 2 of a. <clears throat> and this is going to be 
less than, or we could say less than or equal to, uh, this guy right here is going to be less than or equal to um, um, epsilon. Okay? So if epsilon replaces this part. Okay? So what we end up getting is that this difference between the integral of a to b of f d alpha minus this integral, we know the answer to it. It's the sum as i runs from 1 to n. It was uh, c sub n of f of s sub n. Say s. Okay. That's going to be less than or equal to m times epsilon. That uh, worked for any n bigger than big n, and I took this in particular. And that's the exact definition, we can think of this like an epsilon, uh, that kind of gives us that the sum is i runs from 1 to infinity. Oh, these should be i's here. <coughs> of c sub i, f of s sub i, uh, converges to this interval right here. Where we think of sum as i runs from 1 uh, to n, or 1 to infinity, is of the c sub i f of s sub i, which is a series of real numbers. And that completes the proof. Here, this was a if you will, a sequence of partial sums. Next theorem is a very important theorem that relates, in certain situations, the Riemann Stilgis integral uh, to the Riemann integral. <coughs> Here's what it says. It says, assume alpha is um, increasing monotonically. integral functions on A to B. So, <clears throat> then we say let F be a bounded function. Is Riemann interval on A B. <coughs> In this case, the integral from A to B of F D alpha is equal to the integral from A to B, this was the Riemann Stevens integral on the left, is equal to the Riemann integral. Uh, from A to B of F alpha prime dx. Ladies and gentlemen, here we're going to have an if and only if statement. And normally what I do, which is kind of common for us mathematicians to do, is to start off with one assumption, prove the other, and then <clears throat> start off with the second assumption, prove the first. But in this case, what I'm going to do is uh, really work to get a result 
that it will apply that if one of uh, one of these is Riemann uh, integral, Riemann still is integral, then the other one will be Riemann integral. So <clears throat> there's going to be if and only if statements in my work here. <coughs> <coughs> Start off with the proof. And we'll say let epsilon be greater than zero be given. Uh, since we know alpha prime is a uh, Riemann integral, then there exists this partition of A to B, say. We're going to denote it by P is equal to X of 0, X of 1, all the way up to X of N, where we know X of 0 is, of course, A and X of 1 is B. Uh, such that the upper sum with this partition and alpha prime minus the lower sum with this partition and alpha prime is less than epsilon. Now that's one of the big facts that we have. Okay. Since <clears throat> we're assuming that alpha is uh, differentiable because it exists, now on A to B is what we meant in the statement of the theorem. <clears throat> Then, by the mean value theorem, there exists these T sub i's, and they're going to be elements of <clears throat> x sub i minus 1 up to x sub i. <coughs> such that alpha prime of P sub i uh, times alpha of x sub i minus alpha of x sub i minus 1 uh, will be equal to, I'm sorry, it shouldn't be alpha, so it should just be x sub i. Right. So x sub i minus x sub i minus 1 will be equal to alpha of x sub i minus alpha of x sub i minus 1. And so what we have is the alpha primes of the t sub i's times this is the delta x sub i is equal to, this is the delta alpha sub i. <coughs> okay. Okay. <coughs> now we let S sub i be elements of x sub i minus 1 up to x sub i, these sub intervals. And then by a previous theorem, because of the upper sum minus the lower sum being less than epsilon uh, and the alpha prime is 
uh, element Riemann integral functions, uh, we have that the sum as I run from 1 to n of the absolute values of the alpha prime of S sub i's minus the alpha prime of T sub i's okay, times the delta X sub i's will be less than epsilon. <coughs> equal to the soup of the absolute values f of x. Okay. Now note the sum as i runs from the absolute value, the difference of these two sums. The first sum is the sum as i runs from 1 to n of f of s sub i times delta, delta alpha sub i minus the sum as I runs from 1 to the n of f of s sub i times alpha prime of s sub i times delta x sub i, this sum is equal to, okay, it's equal to the absolute value of the sum as I runs from 1 uh, to n of f of s sub i. And then here, we replace this delta alpha sub i by uh, what we had by the mean value theorem. And that's the uh, a prime of t sub i's times delta x sub i minus the sum that we have right here. So that's equal to the absolute value of the sum as I turn it from 1 to n of the f of s sub i's times, combining these stuff, we just get 1, alpha prime of t sub i's, we have to write it, minus alpha prime of s sub i uh, times the delta x sub i. <clears throat> now, this is going to be less than or equal to, this is like the triangle talk that being applied here multiple times. So this could be less than or equal to um, the sum of the absolute values of the f of s sub i's times the absolute value of, here, of a prime of t sub i minus a prime of s sub i and the absolute value of this guy is itself delta x sub i's. <clears throat> now, we replace this by something bigger than it. That's the sum as I run from 1 to n. Uh, that's the sum as I run from 1 to n, and we replace it with m. And here's this alpha prime t sub i's minus alpha prime of s sub i's, <coughs> delta uh, of x i's. <coughs> now when we pull out the m, uh, outside the sum, Oops. So I get the sum of the alpha primes of t sub i's minus the alpha primes of s sub i's times the delta x sub i's. But this we had being less than uh, epsilon, so this is going to be uh, less than m times epsilon. So uh, since sum as I run from 1 to n of f of s sub i uh, 
delta alpha sub i minus this other sum, which we'll be more of it, I run from one in, <coughs> of l of s sub i times alpha prime s sub i times delta uh, <coughs> x sub i is less than m times epsilon, then <coughs> what we get is that the dispersed sum is going to be less than m times epsilon plus the second sum. This first sum, to get this line, of course, we just use that when you have something inside absolute values uh, less than a positive number, what's inside absolute value has to be uh, less than that positive number. Of course, greater than the minus of this positive number. So I just work with this and then add a, this second sum to both sides. <clears throat> Here, this first sum is going to be less than m times epsilon. And here, we replace this by something bigger, and that is the upper sum um, with respect to our partition of L alpha prime. Uh, and this is the upper, upper Riemann sum. And that's what we have. Okay. And this is a statement uh, that's true for all S of I's. Uh, all choices of S sub i that can be elements of X sub i minus 1 up to X sub i. That last statement, because it's true for all the possible S sub i's, <coughs> have here gives us that that left hand sum uh, is going to be, uh, or this statement is going to apply instead of the left hand sum, we can have the uh, upper sums for the left hand side. That is thus we have the upper sum with respect to this partition of L with respect to alpha. This is the Riemann Stilges upper sum. It's going to be less than or equal to uh, what we had over here on the right hand side before, which I'm just going to reorder. The upper sum with respect to P F alpha prime, that's a, a Riemann sum plus <coughs> M epsilon. Okay, less than or equal to. Okay, <coughs> similarly. Since we had that absolute value statement involving these sums, okay, since this is less than uh, m times epsilon. <clears throat> okay. Then, uh, working with the other way to write the other part of the inequality from this inequality involving absolute values, we have minus m times epsilon is uh, less than uh, these sums without absolute values. So then if I uh, <clears throat> rewrite this uh, to say that the sum as I run from 1 to n, bringing back the second sum over, of the f of s sub i uh, times alpha prime of s sub i times delta x sub i, that's going to be less than this sum that's over here. plus the m times epsilon, so it's a very similar statement. <clears throat> okay. okay, and so 
from here we get this sum, the same type of work. F of S of I, alpha prime S of I, delta X of I is going to be less than, here we'll replace that with something that's bigger than it, and that's going to be the upper sum. Uh, this is the upper Riemann Stilges sum. plus this m times epsilon. Okay. And that statement just made is true for all choices of the S sub I's. similar to it, gives us that the absolute value of this upper sum minus this other upper sum, this is Riemann Stilgis sum, that this has got to be less than or equal to m times epsilon. Now, <clears throat> the above work all this work is based on P. <clears throat> but this above work also holds true for any refinement of P. Say P star. Okay? That is. Since we have any refinement of P that this is going to work for, <coughs> okay, write that down. Okay, since this happens for any refinement of P star, that's enough for us to transition. Uh, from this statement into states involving the theme of the these guys. <coughs> then, really what we have is that this uh, sorry, this upper Riemann, this should be an alpha prime here. This should have been a prime here and here. Okay. Then, <clears throat> this upper Riemann sum F alpha prime dx minus, it's not Riemann sum, Riemann integral. This upper Riemann Stilgis integral will be less than m times epsilon, where we have this difference inside the absolute values. And so since epsilon greater than zero is arbitrary, then that says that this upper Riemann angle equals to this upper 
Riemann square root sample. Okay. Well, we do the same type of work working with these <coughs> lower sums. So let me write out some of the details. So similarly, since we have that the sum we did our work before, we had this sum as I run from 1 to n of f of s sub i times the delta alpha sub i was less than this m times epsilon plus this sum as I run from 1 to n of f of s sub i alpha prime of s sub i times delta x sub i. We had that result before. Um, then, uh, <clears throat> the lower sum involving this guy. So this would be with L, I'm sorry, with P, L, and alpha. Lord, we must do this sum. It's going to be less than or equal to M times epsilon plus this sum here. And this is true for all choices of <clears throat> S sub i's element of this closed interval. And so that allows us to pass along to this statement. So this lower Riemann field sum is less than or equal to m times out epsilon, I should say, plus this lower Riemann sum. <coughs> also, since the sum is I run from one n of f of s sub i alpha prime s sub i times the delta x sub i is less than the sum as I run from one to n of f of s sub i uh, delta alpha sub i plus m times epsilon. That's something we had before. Then, <coughs> then taking the beamums here, we get something smaller. And that's the lower with respect to P of F alpha. Uh, this is alpha prime here. Okay, it's going to be less than this sum this is alpha sub i plus M times epsilon. And so this is true for all choices of S sub i again, and this x sub i minus 1 to x sub i. <coughs> that allows us to pass along to this statement. Um, so this lowered uh, sum this is Riemann sum, it's going to be less than or equal to m times epsilon plus here, this is going to be the lower Riemann Stilgis sum.
Okay. Uh, the above work. Oh, and so those two statements that we have that are similar, this one, the other statement, they combine to give us that the absolute value of the difference between the lower sums is less than m times epsilon. Okay. <coughs> now, this work, this is true. This work is true for any refinement. Partition P, say P sub scalp. And that's enough for us to take this and pass along to get the statement that the lower sum, or lower interval for may be of F alpha prime dx, so that's the Riemann number, minus the lower integral of beta D of F d alpha, that's the less than or equal to M times epsilon. And since Epsilon greater than zero is arbitrary. Then we get that these two things, these two intervals, must be the same. Okay. And so uh, if one, <coughs> I should say then, if F is Riemann Stilton's interval, <laughs> then this lower sum equals to its upper sum, but that implies that this lower, not this lower sum, this lower integral equals to its upper integral, and that would imply that this uh, inter lower integral equals to its upper integral. <coughs> and so we get that if this guy exists, this guy exists, and vice versa, if this guy exists, then we get, uh, we're talking about the FF. Alpha prime is Riemann Stilton's integral. It's going to imply that F is Riemann Stilton's integral. So F alpha prime is Riemann integral. Why is F is Riemann Stilton's integral? And that's the thing. <coughs> that's enough for lecture 15. Uh, thank you very much.